tonight we have five exciting panelists who have generously agreed to join us and tell us a little bit more about how they applied their studies to their own career paths in music, medicine, and business. Um, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. Um, you panelists, if you would state your name, your graduation year, your majors and minors, what you currently do and where you're currently located. Um, we're going to start with Kana and then go to Elizabeth, Jeff, John, and then Sarah. Kana? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Hi, um, Kana McGee. I graduated from Emory in 2019 with a double major in music and French. Um, what I'm doing now, I'm currently a second year PhD student at Harvard studying musicology, and which is a fancy term for music history. Um, and I'm currently located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That was everything, right? I hope so. I think that's what my short list is. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Brachiba. My maiden name was Davis when I went to Emory. Um, back in the 90s, so I graduated in 97, I was um, a music major. That was my only major. Um, and I came in pre-law, I thought, um, with a double major in music, but graduated with music, minor in Italian. I'm currently the Chief Advancement Officer at Washington Performing Arts, coming to you from my office actually downtown. I had to come in today. Um, and I focus on organizational strategy, fundraising, governance, and support all those functions of the organization. And this is parallel with still being an artist. So I did spend time as a full-time professional opera singer and classical vocalist and also crossover vocalist. And I do still sing from time to time, although less frequently these days. Uh, my name is Jeff Wang. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, 2004 graduate, actually at the Guizota Business School, and then uh, minor in music. Spent four years in the Embry Symphony playing cello. Um, I'm currently now trying to teach my nine-year-old daughter how to play cello. Um, pro tip: not not fun. <laughs> would would not advise a parent teaching child at that age. Um, I uh, actually have a, um, I'm at, in Seattle, Washington, and I work uh, for Wonderman Thompson, which is a global ad agency. Uh, they do strategy there. Um, and so if anybody's seen Mad Men, it's like that um, with, you know, hopefully a little bit of uh, more modernizing in terms of uh, opinions, but uh, yeah, that's it. Hi, everybody. My name is John Gennaro Devlin, and I graduated 08 from Emory's College with a double major in music and Latin. I use one of those degrees more than I use the other at this point. I'm an orchestral conductor. I live in Wheeling, West Virginia, where I am the music director of the Wheeling Symphony Orchestra, and I'm very glad to be here. Hi, I'm Sarah Earp. I'm a graduate of Emory College in 2012. Um, I was a double major, music and neuroscience and behavioral biology. Um, after graduating college, I went straight to med school and I'm currently a psychiatry resident. Um, I'm in my final year of psychiatry residency and moving on to forensic psychiatry fellowship next year. I'm also chief resident right now. Thank you all. Um, the first question I want to ask is for you to cast your minds back to when you first arrived at Emory. What did you want to study and what led you to major or minor in music? I'll dive in. Um, Jump in. Sure. So I, I came to Emory with a Dean Scholarship in Music. I don't know if this still exists, but it was a part of the Scholars Program. And so I always knew that I would be a double major. Or that's what I thought when I, when I came. I had anticipated being pre-law and then going somewhere and being in the ACLU. That was what I perceived to be my path when I started. Um, with a lot of feedback from my applied instructors um, and other experiences, it led me to pursue the performance path and to um, go to a conservatory for grad school. But it was really just being immersed in such a fantastic department and having so many incredible influences around me. A lot of my peer group um, immediately before me in school are also still making their lives in music. And so there was a real groundswell at that time. And um, so I was really excited to actually focus and become solely a music major. I'll go next. Um, I, uh, Elizabeth sounds similar, you know, I had the pre-law on the brain, um, 
a lot of my uh, my Emory friends still are, um, I feel like just finishing up med school <laughs> or, or residency, right? Uh, and so it is a long career. It's a long, long time from uh, 2004. Um, but yeah, I, I think for me, my path took me um, divergently, you know, and I will say, say this actually uh, very honestly, and um, just don't tell any of your B-school friends, I feel like my cur current career in, in business um, uh, as you know, a, a strategist, um, a lot of my humanities classes had, uh, were actually, I would say, more impactful in terms of practicality and kind of driving my own curiosity, I think um, sort of personal rigor. And again, sh can't tell any of your school buds that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I uh, really enjoyed my, my time at Emory. And um, I think uh, a lot of the coursework and specifically my minor in music was, you know, one way to, I think, just stay close, stay close to the, uh, my cello, you know, and I was in, I, I did the kind of youth orchestra thing in Dallas, Texas growing up and, you know, thought I'd be a music major and, and go into the performing arts. And for me, it was just an important way to stay, stay close. And, you know, say now, you know, 20 years later, I'm still playing for, you know, string, string quartets here in the area. And again, failing my attempts to teach, you know, my own small children how to play the instrument. I would definitely say I didn't know what being pre-law really meant. I'll just add that. And I assumed it was that you had to be a poli-sci right. major, all of these things. I also never didn't really understand what the path was like to go to a conservatory, even when I was applying to them. So it was, I, I really appreciated overall echoing what Jeff said, like just this liberal arts education, you know, critical thinking skills, learning how to make a case, all of those things. And in fact, recognizing through the course of being in school and then later that any of your disciplines allow you a platform like to for me for social justice I can do that through the arts you know I didn't need to do that through being a lawyer I could I could advocate from my position as an artist or someone who is powering art forward just to add on I guess I, I'm happy to jump in next um for me I I, I echo exactly um what Elizabeth was saying about the liberal arts component of my education paying off in ways that I could never have imagined. Because if I had, be I was a clarinet player, if I'd become a professional clarinetist, I would have been in a practice room by myself for six hours a day and then on stage playing music someone else assigned to me in the way that they wanted me to play it. Um, because I became a conductor, that, that kind of social justice aspect or other things, like I decide what an orchestra programs. I decide who we commission. I decide who the soloists are on stage. I decide what our youth orchestra looks like. And all of these things emerge much more from my liberal arts background than from musical background. But the nice thing about Emory is that you can do both. And so, of course, I developed the musical skills that were needed for a job like this one. But there were so many people around the country making that path. And frankly, they were doing it from places like Eastman or Juilliard or NEC or Shepherd and doing it at a higher level, maybe intrinsically in a certain sense of that word but what Emory provided me was that breadth of understanding of how music fits into the global environment that we end up in and um, the other thing that I will say is that there's some kind of niches that you can fill at Emory because of its focus on undergraduate education maybe not as much in you know, the medical side of things but certainly in the, in the liberal arts schools um, there were no conducting graduate students in orchestral conducting so when I developed this as an interest in the middle of my junior year I was on the podium almost right away because I wasn't competing against people paying $30,000 a year to be there to do that. So um, if I think that kind of individualized pathway uh, encouragement in the honors thesis program that at least was there while I was there it was really positive for me, uh, along with all of the opportunities, like, like Jeff said, to play in the orchestra and be a chamber musician. Yes, happy to jump in. Um, so when I finished high school, I went to high school in Atlanta and my parents were affiliated with Emory kind of my entire life. So Emory was kind of kind of a guarantee uh, pretty much since I was born. Um, and I ended up settling on music uh, again because I kind of felt like I was always going to do that. I knew I wanted to do doctoral work one day and I had this liberal arts dream of doing some kind of math and music double major. And then I realized that I was really bad at math. Um, so I decided to sort of commit really hardcore to do two humanities majors and you know, it was like the best choice that I could have made for myself, I think, um, freshman year when I had to make that declaration. Um, and I also knew that I didn't want to perform for a living and I found composing really hard. And so I settled on the research track of the, that the music department has this three track system. 
And that really worked for me. It could be really flexible. Um, I could do composing if I wanted to. It meant that I could take voice lessons um, if I wanted to as well and still sing in choir and make time for the other kinds of things I was doing. So, um, and now I'm here today. <laughs> I'll jump in. And I realize they forgot to mention um, where I am right now. So I'm in Boston, Mass. Um, I'm at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School um, program. Actually, I guess we're neighbors, Kenna. Um, but <laughs> um, so yeah, I came in just like Elizabeth as a Dean's Music Scholar. So I 100% knew I was going to major in music. Um, and I knew I wanted to like play in different um, ensembles, chamber, single ensemble, just like kind of everything. Um, I also came in as a hardcore pre-med. I was 100% set on being a doctor, um, didn't have any doctors in the family, so I just like threw myself into it, um, which kind of explains why I was also a neuroscience major. I don't know what it, it was like for when you all were, um, were at Emory, but uh, in my day, neuroscience was a really good major. If you were, wanted to be pre-med, it was just like very easy. Um, and then I think like the marriage of neuroscience and music, like really, I don't know, uh, defined my my Emory experience. So I actually did a thesis on like um, the neuroscience of birdsong and compared it to the experience of humans listening to music. And like, it was really fun and awesome. Um, yeah, I think like only Emory would you be able to do something super unique like that and, and be supported by everyone around you. It's really interesting to hear you guys talk about how, you know, the humanities have kind of prepared you for your careers and other ways, you know, outside of just, you know, performing music. Um, and I would love to hear more about that in a little bit. But first, I kind of like to hear a little bit uh, from all of you about how you got from Emory and graduating um, to your current role and career. Um, and sort of, you know, when you were graduating and leaving, what did you think was next for you? I will just forewarn everyone that I am very extroverted and I'm also a singer. And so I will never just shy away from sharing. Um, but, uh, but so um, Julia, if you ever want to call on one of us to start, I, I'll just speak for myself. I'm happy to be called on to, to start if we're feeling a little tentative from time to time, but I'm not gonna start this time. I'm just telling everybody that I'm comfortable with just starting. Um, but I don't wanna, I'm very sensitive to dominating in some way or leading every time. I feel like I'm the number two extrovert. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, Julia, I'll go. I mean, I, uh, uh, unlike my, uh, I feel like very prepared um, pre-med friends, you know, who uh, went on their track and, you know, had a, a straight path to grad school. And, um, you know, I, for me, I, uh, one, looked for, I actually got a job in the Atlanta area in, uh, at an ad agency. Um, and, that path was, you know, I, th I think, that, like many college graduates, you know, toward your senior year, uh, if, if it's anything like uh, what my senior year was like, that second back half of the semester is just job applications, you know, looking for networking opportunities, you know, finding other Emory grads to speak to and, and get some of that guidance. So um, I think that that took me down a path uh, toward advertising and um, specifically, I think for myself, again, I, I mentioned it earlier on the value of that kind of liberal arts humanities is um, the specific uh, discipline within that agency was less on the kind of producing and production side, but really around business strategy and about consumer insights. And that has actually led to, you know, uh, what I am today um, to lead our, our strategy team, which is like this morning I was on a, you know, two hour presentation to clients about TikTok and the ocean spray guy and what brands can do to react more quickly to that. And a lot of that's like a, you know, arguably a sort of a direct connection to a lot of the humanities education uh, because so much of business today is about pivoting and change and adapting to change. And we've had some pretty deep discussions uh, today about uh, the differences between Gen Z and millennials and the implications on education it was it was such a clear path to, to what I do today. Jeff, I think your um, audio was distorted for a little bit. Would you mind going back and repeating the last couple of sentences? Oh, sure. 
Yeah, yeah. Just um, I think that last uh, the last part was just that uh, so much of what I do today, I think, is is fueled through. Um, again, I think Elizabeth mentioned it, and so you've drawn around critical thinking. Uh, you know, my favorite classes was interdisciplinary studies, maybe unsurprisingly, because uh, I feel like it really helped me critically, uh, you know, uh, so much of my day is reading like 92 page PowerPoint decks, trying to glean information really quickly, recreate it, and then uh, present it to others in a really succinct, you know, kind of storytelling manner. And I imagine a lot of us professionals, uh, that's it's a big part of our day. And I, I so value the the Emory education because I, I feel like I have this sort of intrinsic, you know, advantage, you know, that like, oh, like I, I was sort of trained for this, you know, this is a lot of um, what I did for four years. I'll, I'll go next. And the reason why is because Elizabeth, I love that you said, and Jeff, that you're extroverts. I am like a major introvert. You'll literally need to pull me out of my hole sometimes to answer questions. So I'm just going to try to overcome that. Um, um, so my path was pretty like clear from um, Emory to the next step for me, which was med school. Um, I went to med school at Cleveland Clinic, um, which is a five-year institution that's kind of also research-based. Um, so I went straight there, graduated in 2017. My path to psychiatry was very, very different. Um, I went into med school thinking I'm going to be a surgeon. Um, I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. Um, I don't, I, I don't know why I wanted to do that, but, um, but kind of like once I started interacting with patients, I realized that um, psychiatry is my passion. I love it. I could never do anything else within medicine, um, but I didn't realize that until the fourth year of med school, which is stupid. Um, so then I ended up here in, in Boston doing uh, my residency, and then the pathway to forensic psychiatry kind of also came um, in a different way. So I started to become more interested in like social justice issues. And I, I felt that I could have a greater impact on um, systems as a psychiatrist than um, on individual patients. And so that's kind of how I started thinking about maybe something like forensic psychiatry, combining my interest in research and education and, and advocacy and, um, you know, eventually maybe policy, maybe law school. I really don't know what's, what's in the cards for me, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll say like, I actually don't, I think everyone kind of mentioned what instrument they play or if they're a singer or not, but um, I'm a violist. And so the violist like is a very introvert instrument and also like a very collaborative team player, like supporting player type of instrument. Um, I think that's kind of my personality too. And I think like playing in ensembles, like large, small, whatever has taught me to come out of my shell um, and not just like fall into that like supporting role. Um, I think it's also helped me like collaborate with others with really different personalities, which happens in medicine and especially medicine and other fields. Um, and also my patients, like it just helps me kind of like understand something outside of psychiatry that makes me more able to connect with people. So love it. Great. Um, I guess, like Sarah was saying, and her path being relatively clear, I feel like mine was very much the same way and that I knew kind of that I was going to go to a PhD program after I finished at Emory. Um, so that senior year kind of was a crazy time of finding schools, sort of blindly trying to throw things out there and see what stuck. Um, and I, you know, I did a lot of, I'd had a research fellowship the summer before that helped me write my honors project. Um, and so I didn't expect to end up at Harvard at all, really. I just thought I would end up at UNC Chapel Hill and sort of stay in the Southeast for a bit. And then I got in and kind of took the chance. And so that was a surprising next step. And my work has also really changed a lot from what I did in undergrad. I was did my thesis on French art song in the 19th century. And then I have really done a hard pivot to talk about music and the environment now, kind of thanks to the ability to think really flexibly and flexibly and really widely that I got out of the Emory experience to just sort of put things together in kind of quirky and weird ways to see what kind of comes out of them, um, which again, I knew I would be able to do, but it's just been surprising how well that skill has transferred over into the new sort of direction that my life is taking. Um, and in addition to that, I had a bunch of I had my fingers in a lot of different pots in the music department. I worked in the admin desk. I was the choir leadership for a couple of years and I did a bunch of other stuff I can't even remember right now, but all those skills have also been really helpful in shaping the way I think about how an academic institution looks, which will really help me as I 
move forward and hopefully an academic career later on. So. And, and I'm happy to report that my path was anything but clear. Um, you know, one of the weird things about becoming an orchestra conductor is that almost nowhere in the country do undergraduates get to be orchestral conductors. You're almost always going to do performance until uh, master's level program. And so there's no SATs or GMAT or LSAT that you can take to be a conductor. You don't know if you're going to get into Curtis or you're going to, you know, East Appalachian State, Tech, Southeast, whatever. There's no. So I apply to 30 schools because conducting programs, they take one person a year. So um, it's a really difficult thing to know where to aim. Um, I, and, and I found a really beautiful home in the Washington DC area at the University of Maryland. That was the teacher that I connected with best was there. Um, and so I, I stayed there for master's and doctoral studies. And then um, uh, almost everybody who's a musician faces a really scary second juncture, which is what do I do once I stop having a teacher and paying tuition? Because you have to figure out a way to make money, right? So I was very lucky to be able to stay in the DC area for the next um, four years and uh, work with some of the better established orchestras in the area, start my own, work with a community college and a community orchestra, and, and found that I really loved that music director position rather than being a guest conductor. So sent out a lot of unsuccessful applications uh, along the way, of course, but I'm really happy to have found a home here in West Virginia where I think like a few of you have referenced that ability to, to tinker and experiment and say, it's okay if this doesn't work because I know I have nine ideas coming after that and one of them's gonna hit. Um, that's really fun to be able to experiment with, I think no matter what field you end up in. And I, I love doing it in music. We love it. So um, this is a good segue from Kena to John to me. So Kena, my thesis was on Italian art song and to do with resurgimento, I would love to learn more about your thesis. Um, and as it pertains to John, I'm actually married to an orchestral conductor and that's a part of my path, um, which was incredibly circuitous. So I mentioned earlier that I was receiving some really positive feedback, you know, from my applied teachers and was encouraged to think about going to conservatory. And I mean, I had never even seen an opera before I came to Emory. I had always sung, I had always done a lot of choral singing and I was an actress. I had done a lot of musical theater, but um, opera was totally new to me. And actually I really fell in love with recital repertoire as it sounds like maybe Kena has an, an interest there too. So I, I, wanted, I knew I wanted to immerse in that as well. Um, but my application process to graduate school was rather haphazard. I will say that I had no real clue either about what a career path looked like for a singer after graduate school. And I, that has a lot more to do. I think the nature of graduate school education to prepare performing artists for the real life of a working artist, that there's a lot of room for um, development there. And in fact, the whole field of career studies has really emerged since I was coming up into the field. Um, but I was focused, like John, on thinking about the teachers that I would study with. So I had a little bit of guidance there, but it was a bit of a strange situation because my teacher at Emory had left was, um, for a couple of years and now she's back and she's amazing. Some of you may know her, Terry Hopkin was my um, teacher, but my someone else who was kind of in a, an interim role was there for a couple of years, my senior year. So I was a little bit out there like, huh, let's see what happens. Um, what happened was I landed at Peabody and had a great experience, but very naively um, thought, oh, I'll give this two years after I graduate. Like, let, let's see what happens. And then I don't know what I thought would happen in those two years to know that here I am, I'm, I'm doing it. Um, I did actually work full time as a singer and I'm um, doing some teaching as well for three years. Um, I will say that I was living at the poverty line. I was also supplementing that with a lot of great restaurant work um, that I loved and also temping. I mean, all manner of things. Um, I'll say for any of you who are anticipating a performance career, you know, you are always an artist no matter what you do to pay your rent. Um, so I was doing that for three years in Baltimore. And to me, that was a real, um, it was a personal choice. Like I, I knew I wanted my primary activity to be around making music. Um, and that's something that's been really a pleasure to come back to. So then along the way, I met this guy that I, a Peabody who I married now 20 years later, orchestral conductor, and I became the trailing spouse. So it was his jobs that were taking us from place to place. And I needed to learn how to, actually that worked well for me because I am sort of a gypsy. I didn't need to learn. I was excited by that. So our first job took us to New York because he was teaching at Juilliard. 
all the singers I knew said, you get a temp job in legal or finance, like this is what you do. Or, um, and I was like, well, that's not my jam. I'll do academia instead. So I wound up at Columbia and this is very weird and lucky, but I'll just say um, for any of you who might think about, I don't know if temp work even still works this way because resources are much more limited now, but I was offered a full-time job and it was in the real estate division of Columbia University. And Columbia is actually the second largest landowner in New York. So what wound up happening is I discovered that there is essentially a business side to universities. And later I realized nonprofits. By that, I mean administration, management, fundraising, marketing, all those things, PR, that are interesting and exciting and that make the academia and the art happen. So that was sort of my first exposure to that. My husband then got a job in Dallas. We moved to Dallas for three years. I liked being an essay. I had a lot of gigs on the books, actually. I didn't want a full-time job again. I should say this, that my mentors were really willing really to work around my singing. So when they offered me the full-time jobs, they said, we'll work around it and you can have a flexible schedule. So like I would always also say for any of you who are artists, never underestimate what you can bring to the job and um, see if people will be flexible with you. They were with me. It was very lucky. And then I was able to eventually moved from having these day jobs, what I started out feeling like were day jobs, like executive assistant and then moving up to become parallel careers. So when I left New York to go to Dallas um, and wound up working at SMU, in stepping into that job, um, my mentor at Columbia had said, you know, you should try to go for the job, not the executive assistant, because you can contribute to that level. And that I totally owe to my Emory education. I mean, I could be a part of the wider conversation, you know, strategy, connecting the dots, making the case, whatever that would be. So SMU, then a private secular school in Dallas, it was also terrific. Um, and then we came to Philadelphia because my husband got a job there. I wound up at the Curtis Institute of Music. It was a chance to wed music, higher ed, and these business functions together. And then I, I wound up in learning more about development. So these first two opportunities were both temp jobs that turned into full-time jobs. And then it started to become a career. So at Curtis, um, my portfolio, had included development, which I had picked up in Dallas, added marketing and PR, and then now, and then the organizational strategy and governance piece. So somewhere in there too, I worked at an art museum um, that I loved in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And then we moved here with my family for Washington Performing Arts. And so we are the nation's first, actually the first nonprofit arts presenter in the country. And we um, anchor arts education in more than 100 DC public schools. Um, what I love is that my experience at Emory in this very well-rounded view allows me to have a conversation with all kinds of people and to just uh, get back to the think critically piece, but it's about being able to position the organization, being able to figure out what's gonna appeal to an audience, um, being able to talk to diplomats. We have an embassy adoption program, you know? And so in DC, in a place like DC, there are folks from all over the world with really interesting backgrounds and just having had that diversity of thought at, at Emory, I think um, really helps me feel connected and confident in those situations. I mean, just having an interest in the world, you know, around us and also programming, um, you know, I think that because the music department is smaller at Emory, it actually gives a chance for music majors to be really creative and inventive and scrappy. And when you have that kind of experience and you're creating your own performances, I mean, I was, you know, designing these, you know, kind of ambitious projects when I was a student there. And, and you can bring that now to what you're doing and, and think really creatively about how to have interesting partnerships. So I love the chance that the Emory affords to think about those things. That's my story. Thank you all for uh, those answers. Um, a lot of you have touched on, you know, kind of the general, you know, ways that the humanities has really helped you think critically and, you know, helped your careers in unexpected ways. And I was wondering, you know, if you all would be able to discuss what specific skills you think you cultivated in your humanities education, you know, your major or minor in music, that have served you in your day-to-day -day work and functionality. Um, and Sarah, I'm actually gonna call on you first, if that's okay, because we have a lot of students who are pre-med in the music department, um, and I would love to hear your perspective on that. I'm glad I'm not the only one. I was actually wondering, like, is, is it still common to be pre-med and a music major? Because I remember like all my friends were, um, like all my music major friends are like doctors now. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would say like, you know, kind of joking, but kind of not music history, you learn to memorize just like super large amounts of information. Um, that's a skill that I used a lot in med school. Um, 
But I would also say just like kind of the the kind of cooperative part. I would like it's kind of the soft skills I think that that you learn as a musician in general. Um, one of the things that I had to overcome, this is kind of getting more personal, but I'm sure other people have experienced this. So one of the things I had to overcome um, was like pretty bad performance anxiety um, as, as a musician. And it, it caused me like a, a lot of stress, like every day, even when I wasn't performing. Um, and I think like having overcome that as a musician has really, really helped me like perform on the spot in situations outside of music. Um, and like knowing that I could overcome something like that, uh, I don't know if anyone else, if I'm the only one, but it's super helpful to have done that. And there is not a situation as like a neuroscience major or any other major that I can think of where I would have to have like forced myself to, to overcome that. Um, so I think that was absolutely fantastic. You will be put on the spot a lot as a doctor. Um, so it's something that you should get used to. Jeff, I was wondering, um, we also, in addition to having a large number of um, music and pre-med majors, we have a, a large number of music and business majors mm -hmm. that could contribute to this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, it, funny enough, I think a lot of the themes Sarah touched on, I, I, um, I, I was part of my job, I interview a lot of folks. And um, one of the things I, I look for is, uh, I, you know, maybe biased, some sort of like orchestral or music uh, um, uh, activity and or sports, because I think there is that sort of like team playerness that is such a critical part of sort of anything in business. And, you know, I think a, a bunch of folks have, have touched on it. Um, the world works on collaboration and, you know, absolutely it's the knowledge you have, but to, to be someone who's sort of um, good to work with, who's like has high EQ, you know, all of these are sort of these like these skills that, you know, honestly, I, I think I, I, you know, the world wasn't, I think, mature enough, or I certainly wasn't in the early 2000s to understand all those concepts. But I think learning through uh, an Emory education, just that ability to, yes, like teamwork to, um, uh, I think everyone's probably, you know, been in a group project where you're like, ooh, that, you know, there, there are certain team dynamics there that can either really help your, your group thrive or, you know, sort of run into roadblocks. So, that absolutely, I think, was um, was a huge part, and and honestly, again, something that I continue to look for um, in you know, people when I think about you know folks joining the team. I would say the other again, I'm just gonna kind of echo Sarah. She made such great points. Um, uh, I, another way I explain my job is you know a bunch of TED talks all day. You know these sort of like succinct 18 minutes. You don't have that much time to sort of keep people's attention to construct really solid arguments to bring a storytelling element into it, you know, and a lot of the presentations I do like starts off often with like, what's that personal anecdote? What's the meme? What's the, what's the hook? And I think uh, the value of that at Emory Education as well of just being able to, you know, uh, again, construct a story that's compelling and interesting to people. And I'd say that's a huge, like it, it's a part of that, you know, being successful in business that, you know, is, is not often written down, you know, Elizabeth, I imagine for your job as well, going out to donors or any of those folks, it's, you know, you can't hand them a spreadsheet and just say, like, sign here, please, you have to really, you know, uh, bring a compelling reason why they join up with you or the value of it. And so, um, again, I, I think that's, that's a huge part of, um, I think, what's helped me be successful in, in the organizations I've been a part of. Yes, Jeff, you, you used exactly some of the phrases that I thought about using, which was one, telling a story and making a case. I mean, I think as a musician, and especially as a singer, you, you are telling stories. I mean, we all are as musicians. And so, but also the critical writing piece, you know, like the excellent writing and just rigor around being able to express yourself and um, position a point. And I think that that comes through just over and over again, you know, whether you're writing for long form or positioning on the web, or as Jeff was saying, you know, you're going to be pitching someone in person and trying to capture their attention. And, you know, for in my field, the difference between trying to pitch a corporate person versus an individual philanthropist, um, these are all very different motivations. I mean, there's definitely, if any of you are double majoring in psychology too, like that will serve you in spades, I think. Um, I think another thing I would add, um, piggybacking on what Sarah said about collaboration, but just listening. I mean, it sounds sort of trite, but I mean, I think what we do in collaborating, and I'm thinking back to my experiences in university chorus and concert choir, um, but really listening and 
this is a skill that just people who haven't been a part, it's a little like team sports, like Jeff was saying, like when you haven't been a part of that experience, you don't, you take it for granted and you actually don't know you're missing something. <laughs> so it's something that you as a musician bring. Um, I also think time management. Um, and maybe part of this was just about like trying to do my thesis my senior year along with grad school auditions and what have you. But, you know, musicians have to balance a lot. Um, in terms of rehearsals and just, and you're learning, you know, your preparation outside of rehearsal and um, together with the rest of your life. So I think that that is a skill you bring to whatever your field is, whether you're a musician or, or another field and it's really priceless. There's a lot of rigor. I feel like there's a lot of rigor in the Emory program that, and, and that's a good thing for preparing you for the world. And if I could add one thing too, um, as, as a part of my music Meyer again, I know I feel like I'm the odd duck on this panel. Um, one of the classes I, I took was um, intro to jazz. And I think it was like all guitarists and pianists. And there's like this weird dude with a cello in the back, um, just trying to you know break out of my like historic classical bubble and, and learning that. And I think it, it, if that Emory uh, uh, music track is, is anything like it, like it was, it does expose you to so many forms of kind of creativity, I feel like. And, and um, Sarah, you touched on performance anxiety as well, right? Like that, those are some super high pressure, at least for me, they were high pressure environments. And um, I, I do think that that's not gonna go away, you know, and certainly in business, um, the, you know, the, the Zoom call where, yeah, you are the person walking through, yeah, a presentation or, walking through a report um, uh, uh, that's, you're gonna face that a lot. And I think um, uh, both that kind of creativity and curiosity, but also uh, presentation experience was, was really helpful as I started my own career. As Elizabeth was talking, I had a thought that I had kind of forgotten about, but also do think about quite often is like this, uh, like musicians were expected to practice every day and you need to set aside half an hour to go through the boring stuff like scales and arpeggios and all those kinds of things. And that idea about routine and doing small boring things every day really makes a difference in like other areas of your life when you're trying to work on things like speaking or in my case, reading for class every day or going on runs or like just other basic life skills that really came out of my training as a musician. Um, like I would not have been able to write my, you know, 90 page thesis if I hadn't learned to do a half hour of something every day, even if I didn't want to. Um, so that's like a particular skill that I think we have in music that a lot of other disciplines just don't have as part of their training. So. And for me, what I would say is um, I hear over and over again from my colleagues that went to conservatories starting at the undergraduate level if only we had been equipped with the skills we actually needed in school. And I said, well, you decided to go to a school where you knew that the education was not rounded. And we've referenced this a lot and talked about, you know, the general humanities based curriculum leading you to be an appreciator of all things. I would be even more direct, which is it trains us to be entrepreneurs. And as a conductor, I spend on a non COVID year, less than 1% of 1% of my time actually conducting. Uh, you know, I'm managing a team of 80 musicians, all of whom are part time and have other jobs. That's a tricky skill. It talked about Elizabeth, you talked about the, the precision of communication, being able to write a really good email, create a really good narrative to sell your season to the board and to donors. I mean, the types of things we have to do are so all encompassing that I think limiting yourself, I mean, of course, eventually, uh, and speaking as somebody that just stayed straight music performance now, like you are assumed to have a certain set of skills and something interesting to stay as an artist, but I'm sure in all of our fields, we're like, we are entrenched amongst peers and colleagues that have the same skills that we have. It's what is our particular authentic interest outside of our field that we can bring into it that then says something unique about ourselves to the people with whom we work. And so for me, that really was the thing that Emory allowed me to do was find those other things that I loved, that I could combine with music that then made me unique in the marketplace once, once I entered that uh, phase of my career. And so I'm eternally grateful for the decision that was almost by accident that I made going to liberal arts instead of conservatory at the undergraduate level, but Emory was the perfect place to do it.
we um, we've talked a lot tonight about you know the humanities and um, you know in respect to careers, and I'm interested to hear about you know the the way that the humanities or your music and major minor has impacted your life outside of your professional identity. You know, for those of you who have kept making music over the years, how has that played out for you? And you just a general sense of how the humanities enrich your life outside of work. Well, I talked about that parallel career piece and I'll just say, I mean, I am, I am an artist, you know, I have um, a 10 year old to seven year old. So right now at this particular life stage, um, my singing is on the back, you know, it's simmering on the back burner, but that said, I get really itchy every couple of years. And there was a period of time where particularly in my thirties, um, and I was even more of an energizer buddy where I was like producing and singing all the time. I mean, really actively, like still pretty, pretty aggressively actually still doing by singing while this parallel career was emerging. Um, and I'd say something that came out of Emory absolutely was art, this passion for art songs. So for some years I was um, the artistic director of an art song series in Dallas and continue to be really involved. Actually, there's a series in Philadelphia that I'm on the advisory board for and um, sing with from time to time. Um, but like that's something that my passion for poetry and um, for telling stories about the world in which we live through art song is totally something that came from Emory. And it was because of the nerdiness of the music department, because um, I'm saying that with fond fondness, I hope that comes through. But I mean, the, the, the way I was really encouraged to think about how to craft a song recital program and what that could mean. And if you're not an art song person, you, you might not know that even in the wider music field, like even where I am at Washington Performing Arts, sometimes the art song recital is sort of like, oh, really? Like, are we going to program that? And I'm like, yes, because it makes the world a better place. Um, so for me, that's something that came out of Emory. And then the, I alluded to this, this wider um, interest and in just an interest in other people and being with a lot of really different kinds of people. I mean, it's what has led, actually led me to have considerable ease and moving, being a gypsy and moving to so many different places and getting to know so many different kinds of people um, and to be interested in what's happening in their lives. So I think there's a, there's a curiosity and an, and an intellectual spark that is encouraged at Emory, um, particularly through all of these small group, you know, small classes. I think back to all these like 20 person seminars, 15 person seminars, um, uh, such a happy time. So I think, so I think that and kind of an interest in the world around me. I mean, it was definitely by being at Emory and actually some of it observing my peers, but also through some interesting scholarship opportunities to study abroad that completely opened my vistas on just perspective on the world. If you don't know, I don't know if it still exists, but the Lemons Scholarship for Summer Music Study Abroad, go for that. If, if that was what took me to Italy my junior summer. Um, and that was life-changing and sort of yeah, really informs my interest in, in, in other cultures today. Um, I'll, I'll jump in uh, uh, again to sort of echo um, some of the things was with you were mentioning. Um, but uh, why don't you go back to, John, you said entrepreneur and I, um, I, I love that word because uh, as soon as Got a couple of friends who uh, found a guitarist and a pianist, and we joined a Texas country band, and I started, you know, made an album, and you know, played in several quartets, and and just and again, yeah, all that was on the side, right? And all that was on the side of of the sort of business life um, that I was pursuing, and so um, I, I do think there is a uh, yeah, creativity, a just like just get up and do it, you know, and and um, knowing knowing what work it takes and. And some of that rigor, you know, we had to practice, we had to uh, do all of those things and, and try to make the time. Um, I, I also think there is this sort of, um, uh, this is sort of related to work, but I, I, I feel like there's a volunteerism that Emory, I, I remember, and I, I think it's still hopefully really strong that um, volunteering spirit and you know, my, uh, my, I have a nine and an 11 year old and at the elementary school that they're at, um, I just, you know, email the uh, the music teacher, which, you know, it's public school education. So she's handling like 17 different, you know, types of music. And it's, it's one teacher in Seattle public schools. And I'm like, Hey, I'd love to come in and just like, and this was pre COVID, but I'd love to just play for the kids and just be able, and I'm not a professional musician, but just this, like, like it's, it's something I can contribute. And I, I feel, I actually do tie a lot of that 
you know, sort of spirit of just jumping in and doing something um, and helping out where you can uh, to, to the sort of Emory experience and particularly in the volunteering area. I guess I'm happy to step in. I It's both a blessing and a curse to be a music academic because it means I can't really listen to anything without having to feel like I have to like have some kind of intellectual thought about it. So I get into a lot of heated debates with friends and even people who are not studying music in this way um, about like what is so-and-so doing in this particular radio pop song. It just, I, it's both a blessing and a curse, but I it really on the whole, I think enriches my life and my ability to appreciate what the artistic world around us is doing and why it's so impactful and moving to all of us. Um, because I think music is special in that it's like, you can't really touch it when you hear it, but you it still moves you in some way. Um, and I have sort of taken that on as sort of like my, what I feel like is my mission in the world is to sort of help people understand the ways that music can really just make us feel and make us move and just have these really incredible experiences that have brought all of us together and also you know, our best friends come from the people we sit next to in our ensembles and who are in our similar like instrument studios and those kinds of experiences. And I think having only been out two years, I'm realizing how different music making is not in a college setting uh, where you automatically have that rehearsal built into your schedule for credit. Um, so it's really different to go to sort of like a community chorus, which I was doing for a bit, or to sing in a church choir with a bunch of strangers who don't go to school with you at all really um so uh, making that adjustment has been part of my adulting process i guess um but those are a couple things that come to mind yeah i i can just add to what you were saying um so i think at least in in medicine um there's two things that music really helps me with the first is burnout so burnout is like super real um it's something that i think we all kind of deal with no matter what career you're in and music is something that i can always go to that's like totally unrelated to work that can help like calm me down so classical music like i listen to on my echo dot every single day um it helps me unwind it helps me kind of helps my brain escape um, and then another thing that's like very annoying about medicine is all your friends are from the hospital. Um, and so being a musician, you kind of get out of that bubble um, by, you know, participating in some sort of orchestra or community chamber group or something like that. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not in orchestra now because of my call schedule, but I was in med school. And um, it's just such a great way to get out of the bubble and meet people outside of your tiny little world. So I love that. And just hearing the conversation from my colleagues on the Zoom tonight uh, has made me think of so many additional things that I got from my Emory experience that now I'm just realizing I got from my Emory experience because others are mentioning it. I think, Hannah, you referenced like a routine. Like at Emory, we were all, I'm sure, these like very accomplished people trying to do as many things as possible. And Emory actually lets you do that. So the time management, Elizabeth, that you mentioned, um, like I heard you, Jeff, say, uh, looking for someone on a sports team. So like I did varsity uh, cross country and track while I was at Emory and I did the, the, I was an ATO, uh, um, that lived in the frat house and also in the music major place where I got my best friends. And so I think that I, I, for the last 10 years, I've been helping some high school students make decisions like this because I was running youth orchestras and I, the parents would say, ask me, should they go to conservatory? And I would just say, no, unless you are so much more certain than anyone else I've ever met about what you want to do at 18 years old. And there were two people that talked me into saying that that was the right thing. And then you pushed them that way. But um, other than that, I just think that, you know, you live in one community or maybe several communities if you've moved around as a young person and you know one group of people, you have one set of parents and you're just figuring out these things in a little bit of a bubble. And Emory's a nice medium-sized bubble to start exploring these things and um, I didn't find what I was meant to do until the junior year at Emory and that felt like a right path for me and so I think it's that idea of being able to have your foot not not in a lukewarm or medium depth area but deep in a pool in Emory but in three different pools because they are they cater to that like the track coach let me miss three practices a week so I could be in the orchestra if you, if I was at a Division One school, that would never have happened, right? But because Emory encourages this breadth of experience, I found the faculty amenable to my path, and now I'm so happy because I see that 
um, it, those experiences continue to benefit me more than if I had been 30% more rigorous as a music student back then. I'd like to go ahead and transition into the um, Q&A section. Um, audience members with questions, if you feel comfortable turning on your camera and your microphone um, and asking your questions, please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or if you would prefer, you can always put questions in the chat. If only I'd had even more time. I see the question about breadth and humanities education. Are there more classes you wish you would have taken other areas? I mean, I flirted with two other majors. I flirted with religion. I flirted with philosophy. Um, I began even flirting with French. Um, <laughs> there's just, there's only so much time. But, like, but I think, as I can say now, as a 45 year old, you know, push yourself to the max. That's my advice. Like soak it all in and just do it all because as much as you can, because you will not have that level of energy again. You may have it in your thirties. I mean, I still have a pretty exceptional amount of energy now, but I'll say I'm tired. Um, and I would love to go back. I mean, that was actually something I'll say this too, about having a career in academia, even on the corporate side of the house, I was actually able to get tuition remission um, working at Columbia and SMU. So I was actually always able to keep taking classes on the side while I was working by day. So I would just encourage you to soak up, um, soak it up. So I don't have regrets looking back. It's rather just, there was so much good stuff I would have loved to. And, and, and in some ways, um, I mean, I did go deep in experiences like John was describing, but I also dabbled. I mean, I, I, there were a lot of things that I dabbled and just kind of mm -hmm. tasted and tested. Yep. Yeah, Elizabeth, I would, I would totally agree. And I, I do think it kind of dovetails into Brian's question there as well in the chat about, you know, anything I would go back and do. And uh, I'm with you. I mean, it, I, I'll be super honest and frank that there are definitely, you know, weekends or days where whether it was burnout or just, you know, sheer exhaustion, you just, you know, you get really comfortable in the dorm room or the apartment and, and it's easy and probably easier than ever, you know, due to the pandemic of just kind of you know, sitting and being still. And I think um, just kind of echoing what a lot of other panelists have said, like there is no time like this, you know, to be able to dabble, right? As, as a professional, it, it is just the inertia is so much tougher to go, you know, look for a continuing ed class. And granted, there were no Airbnb experiences back in, two, you know, 2005, but I think this ability at Emory to just get such a world-class education about a topic that you might never have been interested in uh, before, oh, join a club or you know uh, meet folks or or spend time with people that you know. John, you made the point that like we, we get on all these paths, right? And um, the inertia of, of adulting is is very much about trying to fit you into a box and into a category. Um, so if, if I were to go back, I would just, I'd, same would soak it up. Um, and yeah, some of that is just having fun and. Um, having uh, time with your, your classmates, but also just this, uh, it is such a time to, to learn. I, uh, I do some work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation here in, in Seattle and uh, Melinda had this great, great TED talk around, you know, like adults, you know, you can be 45 and just become a biology major, you know, just through sheer will and, you know, time and granted she's extremely intelligent, but I would put probably all of you in that, that same category. And it does take sometimes so many decades of, of perspective to realize, oh my gosh, I, I can learn this. And she's just expressing that, you know, her and Bill have to become technology experts, you know, in a couple of meetings and have to be biology experts and be supply chain experts. And so uh, you guys at Emory had just have such access to all that. So I would, I would uh, go back and take a few more classes. I can add like a very specific regret that I have um, that doesn't apply to everyone, but actually applies more to my personal life than my professional life. So when I was, I think I was a junior, I um, was enrolled in Mandarin Chinese and I like started hearing things like, oh, it's really hard. Like you don't know any Chinese, like what are you doing? And obviously I was pre-med, so I was super scared of my GPA, like, like tanking. And I heard like this professor is difficult. They don't give out like A's easily. So I just switched to Spanish instead. Um, and I, I think about that every day. Actually, um, I, my partner, I'm getting married in three weeks and my partner is um, Chinese and his first language was Mandarin. And he 
really like really encourages me to learn Mandarin. I didn't know this at the time, obviously. I met him after I graduated, but it's kind of a coincidence. And I'm using Duolingo to learn Mandarin, and I just wish, like, I just wish mm. I knew Mandarin. Um, so I would say just like if you want to do something and you just have a gut feeling that it would be cool and fun, it might actually be relevant later in your life. And don't be scared of your GPA. Just go for it. Can I just echo that one thing about the GPA is uh, I, I don't think it's ever mattered. And at least in my business track, like no one's ever said like, oh, where, why is that not two decimal points different? You know, like, um, you know, don't fail college. But I think in general, <laughs> I imagine if you're on this call, like it's pretty decent, you're doing okay. And, and to, to, uh, to take the hard class, Sarah, as, as you mentioned, um, I think will be worth its weight. Um, in the, you know, point, point zero 0.05 decimal hit you might take. Um, and it could also go up. So. I agree. A big part of my job is hiring, actually. I don't, it has been in my last two jobs in here, too. And, and I never, I mean, and I actually teach a class at American University for building, for arts management, for resumes. And it's like, I don't care about your GPA, like you just don't need to put it on there. I'm more interested in actually seeing, and I'm more attracted to the well-rounded candidates that have, um, you know, a lot of different interests and who show that they're a person. You know, right. in addition, in addition to having, even if you go very deep and narrow in something, but and you're really intense about it, that what else motivates you? You know, and having right. that shine through. And some of that might come from your extracurriculars. Like I was. Um, I mean, one reason I probably didn't take as many classes was because I also had a really active social life at Emory. I mean, I was super, super social and involved in volunteer Emory, and I wouldn't ex exchange those experiences at all either. Um, yeah. One one piece of advice, I mean, Brian, that's a really thoughtful question you ask, and thank you for being so so vulnerable. Um, you know, the we, Sarah, I think you mentioned burnout being very real in your field, and interestingly. What I've seen in the professional orchestral world for the players is that those who have been what you would think would be most successful, I see experience burnout all the time. Players in the National Symphony Orchestra, the most talented, that earn $162,000 of base salary with great benefits and vacation. Why? Because they peak at an early age and get a secure job. And then their job for the rest of their life is to maintain that job. And they're out of the decision-making process. The people that I see remain fresh and vigorous around a musical career, and of course, I'd be interested to hear everyone else's perspectives if you're in a different field, is the person that maintains that second love that I talked about. So like you talked, Sarah, I'll mention you again. You said forensic psychology was where you found your fit right so that's combining two things that might seem disparate but you've made it your own thing and for me for example like I love fine dining like I just think chefs like I watch all the cooking shows and I think that that's the coolest thing so I started gourmet symphony and it paired chefs and musicians for the first time in different ways and that put me on the map a little bit in my neck of the woods. So um, for me, it's like, don't be scared of missing something, except don't let go of something you love because you think, ah, if I want to be really serious about my career in law, medicine, politics, fill in the blank, then I should let go of the other things. In fact, those other things are what people in your field will think makes you most interesting, more likely than not, and may actually come to define you um, in, in, in ways you wouldn't expect. So that's the thing that I would say I'd be fearful of is focusing too concretely on my one thing to the detriment of, of, of others I feel passionate about. I can totally sympathize with that because that is exactly what I did. I was like the complete opposite of a social college student. I like worked three jobs. I was doing the thesis thing. I was like very focused on like where I was headed in my career. And I think uh, upon graduating, I was like, oh my God, I'm not really good at anything else. Uh, and so this, I've been really grateful for this strange year of pandemic to really find those like backup interests again. Um, so sort of be, Emory is a very flexible place, but don't be afraid to like, don't get too constrained within that flexibility, I think is one thing that I tell people all the time is like, if something's really flexible, that means you can cater it almost too much. And sometimes you need to be checked to make sure that you're actually being broad enough within that sort of flexible space. Um, and to like, keep asking strange and quirky questions about the world around you, um, because it will tell you these really surprising things. 
and uh, like reveal those like second things that we're all interested in, like we were all talking about before. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Brian, I, I wanted to add maybe one thing to, to your question, and, and this is maybe more personal to me, but um, Emory has such a, a, such a supportive uh, faculty alumni network. I personally didn't take advantage, I think, as much as I could have, right, of the email your professor, can I get 15 minutes, can I take you out to virtual coffee or on social distance coffee, whatever, and uh, I think you just have such a... Um, uh, I feel like it's it's an undergraduate thing. You know, you're in your late teens and early twenties. You're like, oh, would they really want to? Or you email once and you don't get the reply. Like, I guess they don't want, you know. And and I think um, it, it is such a supportive environment. I would say the same about alums. If there's a market or a city or, you know, someone that uh, that you do want to reach out to, reach out. And if you don't hear back in a week, we're all busy. So reach out again, you know, and, and just, you know, keep pushing because um, I do think there is such a strong, I, I feel loyalty to um, to Emory grads, to, to kids in your exact same scenario, because we were all there and you hear just even on this call of just all the divergent paths that, that we took. And, you know, I would just take advantage of that and, and soak it up and, you know, add it to your own journey. I totally agree. And as someone who has actually spent time on some calls, I even I had a Zoom call with somebody last fall who was connected to me through mm -hmm one of the alumni mentor offices. Um, and it was someone who was thinking about a transition, you know, into arts management. And I, it is such a bright spot in my day. I absolutely love talking with folks who are, who are trying to figure out where they're going and, um, and who, and come with great questions. I mean, that's the, the, along with the tenacity that Jeff recommends in following up because you're dealing with busy people. Um, is like have great questions, you know, come to the table with, with a, a real agenda and make the most of that time. I wish I had done more of that is a regret I, I have thinking back of like even more time with my teachers and also thinking about the alumni network because um, it's so remarkable. I just wanna say as a, um you know, music alum who now works in the music department. Um, you know, I'd echo a lot of what um, all of you guys are saying um, and that there's been a real shift for me in seeing the department through the lens of a student and seeing it, you know, through the lens of a, um, of a staff member and just how, you know, much more flexible and caring and just, you know, all those connections with the faculty that I just kind of didn't really think that I, you know, felt comfortable taking advantage of, or, you know, trying to reach out and form those bonds, um, you know, that maybe I was like a scared student, um, you know, and just to say that that has been really been disproved to me in my time working in the, you know, in the university, um, you know, so on the same, you know, wavelength, um, Jeff and Elizabeth, you know, to really take advantage of the Emory community because it is a forever community and you never know where you'll find yourself. I didn't expect to find myself back working in the music department, but I, I love it. I'm so thankful to be here. And um, you know, you just never really know where things are gonna take you. I think it is about that time to start wrapping up. Um, so if no one else has any questions, um, I wanna you know, thank each of our panelists for being here and for this wonderful conversation. We're very grateful for your insights and your wisdom and advice to all of our students who are here and the students who will be watching um, the recorded version. Um, and thank you to everyone who came here today um, to listen. And I hope that you have enjoyed this panel as much as I have. And, you know, I hope everyone has. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and I guess we will say good night. Julia, can I just add yeah, my yeah. thanks to, and that was Cricket uh, that I was showing my cat Cricket, because some of you may know and love her. Uh, thank you so much, you all. I am just incredibly inspired and uh, can't wait to go back to our faculty meeting on Wednesday and report that, hey, what we're doing is really working. So you all just, so inspiring to me and I hope to the students who have, who have gotten to hear about your experience and all your wisdom. So thank you so much for participating.